The 4400 is the fictional account of ordinary people who've had a portion of their lives stolen without explanation. This phenomenon known as missing time is not merely a Hollywood invention. In truth, far more than 4,400 people have reported this temporary hijacking of their lives. It takes place uh, through Western Europe, through Latin America, through Asia, through Africa. There is no place that we have looked at yet that, that does not have abduction reports. Most identify these experiences as alien contact. Researching the pathology books, no such entity has ever been found in the human body. But researchers, ufologists, academics and scientists all have their own theories to explain why these extraordinary accounts exist. We are constantly making decisions between things that happen out there in the objective world, in real life, and things that are only happening up here. In the last 10 years, theories have been developed where we need other dimensions to explain the way the universe looks to us. The missing time phenomenon is real. This is not some kind of thing that happens in the dead of night to just one person. These are the stories of the real 4400. Of all the reported abduction accounts, there is one case that has created more hype, speculation and controversy than any other. Travis Walton became one of the real 4400 in 1975 when he vanished without a trace for five days. As a result, he has been under constant scrutiny for the past 30 years. I don't know which is worse, you know, that I'm a crazy and strange or that uh, just a liar. Travis claims he was abducted by a spaceship, which he and six of his workmates all saw while working for a logging firm in the Arizona National Forest, USA. Seven woodcutters said they were riding in this truck along an isolated mountain road when suddenly a spaceship hovered over them. This was not some little point of light off in the sky. This was a metallic disc right there, outlined against the sky, totally unmistakable. 22-year-old Travis Walton reportedly got out of the truck and approached the spaceship. Walton was then struck down by a bluish flash of light. I just felt this shock uh, uh, go through my body. It was just kind of like an electrical shock, but it, I blacked out just instantly. Frightened, his companions drove away. When they returned a short time later, Walton was gone. Travis's initial disappearance sparked a murder investigation, but the men's UFO stories combined with Travis's eventual return created an even bigger story that the media lapped up. Did they communicate to you, or did you try to communicate with them? Well, I tried to communicate it with them, and, but there was no answer. They never talked to me or anything. The media circus was just incredible in town, just like things you see in the movies or something, you know. Just doesn't sound like a true tale to me. I do think he had an experience of some kind. Reporters stomping through the flower beds, looking through the windows, you know, ambushing people when they come out of their houses, that sort of thing. I've always thought there could be UFOs, but uh, that story is kind of far-fetched. I'm seeing for believing, and I haven't seen it. You've seen them? Yeah. Around here? We've seen from three to seven in the sky at night. They accused me of, of ducking the media. And then when I finally gave interviews, I'm accused of being a publicity seeker. So I couldn't win, you know? The story turned Travis into the first alien abductee celebrity and ultimately earned him huge notoriety plus a book and a Hollywood movie deal. A lot of people think the motivation is attention seeking or um, uh, financial, but. I'd have to say overall, movie and book included, uh, the net effect has been negative in a, in a financial sense and certainly in a quality of life ex ex sense. I don't want to be the bug in the jar anymore, you know? I don't want uh, that kind of uh, scrutiny. I'd like to just uh, get on with my life and uh, live a normal life. People occasionally come to me and say, I've, I've had this experience, what do you think I should do? And my advice is, 
Well, I tell them what I would do. If it was something like that was to happen again, I wouldn't say anything to anybody. Travis's experience is a clear example of the stigma attached to this subject. While the media enjoy ridiculing these accounts, a growing number of academics and scientists believe these reports require serious investigation. These kind of reports of alien abduction and alien contact have been made for decades now. And it's only relatively recently that people have tried to explain what might be going on. And what we, I think, can quite safely say from recent research is that whatever is going on, these people are not just making it up, they're not just lying, they are sincere in their claims. Chris French is Europe's leading psychologist studying the alien abduction phenomenon and has just published a paper exploring the contact experience. Now, either people really are being abducted by aliens, or alternatively, it's a very, very interesting psychological phenomenon, and we can learn a lot about human psychology by taking it seriously and studying it. The first reported abduction case occurred in 1961 in the White Mountains, USA, and was followed by countless claims across the states. And just as we started down the woods, well, it went up through the trees. It looked like a big cigar shape with light lit from both ends. It looked to me like a flying saucer. With so many accounts coming from just one country, it was initially believed that this was a cultural phenomenon and so couldn't be real. The reason that there, we hear more about it here in the United States is because we have an organization and a group of people who are willing to take this seriously so that there's someone to whom a person can report their experiences. Bud Hopkins started researching this subject in the 70s and is considered by many to be the founder and godfather of this movement. I've worked with between five and 600 people. A uh, prominent NASA engineer, uh, physicist. I still receive probably three potential cases that deserve investigation every week. This is not some kind of thing that happens in the dead of night to just one person. But it's not just America where these accounts have been reported and investigated. The British government first set up the Flying Saucer Working Party in 1950 by the then scientific advisor, Sir Henry Tizard. And the MOD has maintained an interest in this area ever since. Between 1991 and 1994, I ran the British government's UFO project at the Ministry of Defence. That's how I became involved in UFO research, and through that, I got involved in looking at the whole alien abduction mystery. I've looked, I guess, at about 100 cases of people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. They're not mad. They're, they're for real. Something absolutely bizarre has happened to these people. I've got no doubt about it. It's only as serious research has been made public that many abductees have had the courage to come forward. I opened up a book called Encounters by Dr. Edith Fiore. And in the back of the book was a listing of therapists and psychologists who work with people who had had my experience. Michael Carter, a hospital chaplain, had what is known as the classic abduction experience in 1994 while at home in bed. I got up and I looked up and there was a being on, sitting on the edge of my bed, just staring at me. And my room was lit up. That's, it was lit up like it was daytime. I pulled the covers over my head and hoped it would go away. When I did that, I heard this like a whirlwind in my ear and the temperature changed. That was the first encounter. Even to this day, I'm afraid to go to bed with the lights out. With the majority of reported abduction cases occurring between the hours of 10 p.m. and 8 a.m., most skeptics argue that a common sleep disorder called sleep paralysis may be at the root of these experiences. Sleep certainly isn't simple. There are a lot of different stages. It's a complex process. There are lots of chemicals involved, a lot of physiology involved, and lots of things can go wrong with it. 
Dr. Chris Ijikowski is director of the British Sleep Assessment and Advisory Service. He has combined his research of sleep with studies into fear and anxiety. Sleep paralysis is when you wake up out of sleep and find that you can't move. For some people, breathing might be impaired. You start to get this amazing sense of that you're dying. You're frightened partly because you've come out of rapid eye movement sleep, so the physiology is out of control. Heart rate, breathing, everything like that is out of control. Your sensory systems haven't switched on properly yet, so all, there's all kinds of hallucinatory activity. So you can end up with visual hallucinations. You can end up with auditory hallucinations, odd sounds and things. And things. Everybody will experience it at least once in a lifetime. If you experience it a couple of times, then you may start to wonder what's going on. If you experience it more than that, then you really, really get to worry. Now, if you had some kind of an experience like that, you might hear voices or footsteps or mechanical noises. You might see lights moving around the room. You may then come across ufologists who tell you, well, actually, you've probably been abducted by aliens and they've wiped your memory for the rest of this. For sleep paralysis, which is now the explanation du jour, it's the current one, they've had to stretch the meaning to things like micro-sleep, where being a, a sleep is defined as being awake. Professor David Jacobs is director of the International Center for Abduction Research. He's a leading academic who's been researching the UFO and alien abduction mystery for over 30 years. Of the 900 cases that I have looked at, uh, more than half, or as many as half, take place when a person is not asleep. Skeptics use sleep paralysis to explain the majority of classic abduction accounts. But it does little to make sense of reports that take place when individuals are awake or when they involve groups of people being taken together. I was aware of feeling so relaxed, like I couldn't move, yeah. but I wasn't really bothered that I couldn't move. Yeah. You'd, you'd be happy just to sit there and look at it forever or just want it to land and go away with it. Rachel Devereaux is a 35-year-old shop manager from Lancaster, England, who had her first missing time experience only three months ago. What makes her account exceptional is that it was shared by her mother, Anne, and her two sons, Alexandra and Benjamin. been to the little chef and um, we just had our tea there, an evening meal. We left there about half past five. I remember looking at the, the clock so I was thinking I had, yeah, it was about 20 past half five because I thought I've got my ironing to do, I need to get home. Benjamin was in the furthest corner of the car and my nana was in just behind me. The boys were chatting and we remember commenting on the chimneys, the silhouette of the the chimneys really stood out against the sky. Now, when I think about it, that's the last thing I can remember. <laughs> the next thing I remember is just seeing this awesome bright light. I saw it going up and then it hovered right above the car. It doesn't make sense even, you know, when I talk about it, but we all felt that it was like just this absolutely overwhelming love that you just felt from it. You'd, you'd be happy just to sit there and look at it forever or just want it to land and go away with it. Yeah, and leave everything else behind. Are you human? It was hovering for a bit and came in front of the car and hovered. Then all of a sudden it shot off. Then it was like all back of a sudden and then I was driving and the noise was back. You felt this feeling of loss when it had gone because you Definitely. wanted that feeling mm. that it gave you. Mm. You wanted it back again. Mm. Going from the little chef to our house should have taken about 20 minutes. And it's taken us an hour and 20 minutes. 
you know, there's facts that I've gone over and over and over in my head and tried to rationalise and try to fit into what we know as the world today and everything, and it just doesn't fit. While each abduction account has its own peculiarities, psychologists believe the way in which we process memories could play an important role in understanding these incredible reports. We are constantly making decisions between things that happen out there in the objective world, in real life, and things that are only happening up here. A lot of what we take to be genuine memories, often the whole thing is completely fabricated and false, but it feels just the same as a real memory. An everyday example would be, you know, did you lock the back door or did you just think about locking the back door? And it's frighteningly easy to implant false memories in a sizable minority of the population. For example, if you show people a photograph which is actually being computer generated of them from their childhood uh, going on a balloon ride, and this photograph is in with lots of photographs from things in their childhood which really did take place, a sizable minority will actually quite happily tell you about the time they went up in a hot air balloon when they were six, even though that event never actually took place. We do know that we're all potentially prone to these false memories, much more so than we would ever have once guessed. False memory syndrome is based on the idea that memory is faulty. And memory is faulty. Obviously, I'm living proof that memory is faulty the older I get. The fact is, though, that memory is not so faulty that people are going to forget entire events. They might get details wrong. They might get their chronology out of order a little bit. But the fact that they were, for example, in a train crash or, or something like that, they're not going to forget that event. Without anecdotal evidence, without human memory, without the ability to retrieve memories, we would not have a judicial system and a civilization would grind to a halt. Psychologists have developed a wide range of plausible theories to explain why individuals believe they've been abducted by aliens. But all of them have ultimately been countered by ufologists. It has ranged from simply lying to psychosis, it's mass hallucination, it's mass hysteria. It goes on and on and on. There is no end to it. However, skeptics believe there is one simple factor that makes their case watertight. As a scientist, I'm interested in the question of whether or not there is anything happening here in terms of objective reality. If there's no way of us being able to produce any kind of evidence, hard physical evidence, then I'd say that what we're looking at is essentially a psychological phenomenon. In order to really challenge the skeptics' argument, ufologists need to find evidence that can stand up to scientific scrutiny. In France, one of the real 4400 believe they may hold the proof ufologists have been looking for. Je me considère absolument rationnel à la fois dans les activités et dans les pensées que, que j'ai. Eric Julien is a retired pilot and air traffic controller whose career involved making tough decisions while under immense pressure. Pour exercer le métier qui demande une stabilité psychologique extrêmement importante, tant pour être pilote que pour être contrôleur aérien. Over the past 15 years, Eric claims to have had a variety of extraterrestrial experiences, both at home and at work. C'est également le contact radar d'un target sur mon scope radar lorsque j'étais contrôleur aérien dans l'armée de l'air, qui allait de l'est vers l'ouest à 28 000 km h As well as sightings, Eric claims to have had regular contact and communication with alien beings that have given him a clear understanding of their technology. C'est que nos outils scientifiques de preuve sont limités à l'espace matériel de la réalité. Et c'est toute la difficulté que nous avons à comprendre le comportement des extraterrestres précisément. After enduring years of abduction experiences, Eric believes he has recently been left with solid evidence of their visits. Un élément de preuve qui peut être apporté donc à la science, c'est l'apparition soudaine en l'espace. You see it? pourrait être un implant qui a été posé par des extraterrestres au cours d'une nuit. Eric's lump provides science with something tangible it can test. 
But Bud Hopkins believes his 30 years of research has already unearthed all the evidence that anyone would need. The skeptics are fond of saying there's no physical evidence. Um, what the skeptics are saying, gee, I haven't heard of any because I haven't looked into it. Okay, these are some of the photographs of, of scoop marks that turn up again and again. I may have seen a hundred of these. Why don't the critics uh, recognize it? It's because they don't even know anything about it. But Bud has collected photographs of abductees who claim their experience left them with abnormal scars. This is on a man's back. Here's another one on the front of the shin. This is one on a little boy that turned up overnight. He was five years old. I had one case where there were three young women involved in an abduction experience. Uh, and uh, at the end of it, each one had a scoop mark in exactly the same place. The doctors who have looked at these things uh, have told me that they most closely resemble uh, the scars from punch biopsies. Sometimes they will take two samples. A person is re-abducted and another sample is taken. Sometimes people remember the tool that was used. One can infer without <laughs> much difficulty that they are taking a flesh sample to take from us um, our own DNA, our own physical genetic makeup. Again, these are marks which turn up again and again, but we have no explanation of exactly why they are taking this flesh, except obviously they're getting some kind of sample. Eric has come to London to visit a leading ear, nose and throat specialist and have the lump behind his ear tested. Hello. Hello, this is Eric Julien to see Dr. Patel, please. Come on in. He's hoping the results will make sense of his belief that the lump is in fact an alien implant. C'est peut-être une découverte uh, étonnante et, et qui pourra intéresser beaucoup de gens. Glad to meet you. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Okay, let's take a look at this lump. And it's not tender at all if I was to touch it like this, not causing any pain or discomfort. No. Et que ce qui est le plus étrange dans, dans cet uh, implant, c'est qu'il bouge tout seul. Il a bougé de 12 mm en 6 mois. Just turn your head slightly away from me. Et je ne connais pas de corps euh, organique au, dans le corps humain qui puisse euh, faire ce, ce type d'exploit. De, this could be easy to diagnose further by doing a couple of tests. Mm -hmm. And I propose that we do an ultrasound of this area and a plain x-ray. Mm -hmm. And that should give us a lot more information. One of the reasons why Eric believes his lump is an implant is due to the nature of his experiences that took place in the summer of 2003. Hello, Mr. Julian, Alice McLean, nice I'm the radiologist. Parmi les expériences que j'ai connues, il y avait des expériences médicales. You've got a, a lump or a problem behind your ear, I understand. Yes, okay. that's here. J'étais donc souvent allongé sur euh, une espèce de lit dans une salle qui ressemblait à celle d'un dentiste. Et j'ai plusieurs fois connu des expériences de, de sondes au-dessus du crâne et dessus, euh, sur le front. All right, that's probably all we need. Once the ultrasound and x-ray results are processed and evaluated, Eric Julian, post ultrasound. the consultant will be able to provide Eric with a clear diagnosis of his lump. Whether these events are physical or psychological, the need for individuals to make sense of them is overwhelming. Having had a missing time experience, Rachel, Anne and the boys were left confused by what it was they experienced. The next day, we talked about it again and you just wanted to know who else had seen it. But you just didn't know how, how to, to find that out. And, you know, we talked about a number of things and Mum came up with the idea and phone in the radio station, radio the local radio station. A family from North Lancashire have been describing how they saw a mysterious light in the sky last night. Rachel Devereux was driving on the moors between Ingleton and Bentham with her two children and her mother, Anne. They all saw a bright light move at great speed and change directions. Anne says she's never seen anything like it before. This was like a really, really bright, pure white light in a perfect, Bullshit. No trails, nothing. Lots of people say, well, a few people have said they've seen this light seriously. Keith near Clitheroe, Vera in Clitheroe, and Ian in Fenniscoles. 
A local UFO group also heard the family's story and made contact. I got in touch with Anne first. I phoned her up, and that was shortly after they first saw the light. And she was very euphoric about it. She was just wanting to know what it was, really. The UFO group were able to help Rachel and Anne document the events of the night, but the emotional support they could offer was limited. We're a local UFO group. We're not professionally qualified at all. And I think it would be quite difficult for someone to go to their MP, who, I mean, the GP. There isn't anyone who can deal with people who've got a strange experience like this. I think they'll want to get answers to what happened to them during that time. Whether they will do is open to question. You suddenly, you've got all these different factors in your life that are just a complete mystery. It's helplessness and it makes you cry because you don't know how to stop it. You don't know what it was. Um, I mean, it's making me cry now. I don't know why. <laughs> you don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> if you start to think about it like we are now, mm. it becomes overwhelming and you can't cope with it. I mean, they can mock you, the sceptics can say, oh, you've all got false memories and you all imagined it. But I know I didn't, because I know how it's made me feel inside. Mm. More than anything, it's, um, it's just wanting to make sense of it. That's the way, that's the feeling it gives you. Just wanting more knowledge and wanting to, to make everything fit into place in a way that you can understand. While these experiences often create feelings of fear and anxiety, not everyone who reports them find them distressing. In fact, many believe their contact with extraterrestrial beings has ultimately enriched their lives. My first really um, conscious memory of my experiences with extraterrestrials was from about the age of three years old, where I would be meeting, I guess, like my other family. They were no different to me. I just saw them as my, my star family, like, you know, and my parents here were my Earth family. Tracy Taylor grew up in Perth, Western Australia, and claims to have had regular experiences that involved tests on her body and information put into her mind. I think I learned pretty quick not to talk about it. Um, I think I just focused it into my schoolwork and used the knowledge and the understandings that I had to, to do well at school. Tracy's experiences intensified through her teens until she got to the point where she felt she needed to take control of what was going on. I had to question my own sanity, basically. So I went along to visit psychiatrists, psychologists, asked for my brain to be scanned. I'm ready to think, you know, they're going to take me off to the hospital in a minute. The brain scans showed up to be normal. All the psychological tests showed up to be fine. One of them walked up to me and said, you know, is there anything really negative about this? And I said, well, not really, but it's hard to integrate into my life. And they said, well, good luck with it. And I was just... What? <laughs> OK, this is confirmation for me. All right. And that was the end of it. I just walked out of there and thought, OK, I'll get on with it. <laughs> I'll accept it. Tracy now integrates her experiences into the rest of her life and focuses on the positive aspects they've brought her. Also just prints. Fantastic. There's a lot of symbolism here. She believes her contact with extraterrestrials has given her a unique artistic ability that she now wants to develop into a career. The first time I ever did one of these drawings, I just had the urge to get my paper and my pen. Something just sort of came over me and my hand started to move. Do you actually see anything or is it just from within you? Like a, a downloading of 
information, I suppose, in a symbolic form. It just sort of seems to feel like it comes through me. It's not from me. Much more like a sort of radio wave. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's... Tracy was interested in art before these illustrations came through, but claims that her style of drawing changed radically overnight. I mean, this I recognise very much a sort of Aztec type of symbol. Over a period of time, I spoke to people who study ancient cultures and these people were able to pinpoint things in the pictures saying this is something that you could find in a temple in, in Peru and this is something you'd find in a temple in, in Luxor in Egypt. And can an expert read this? I've had linguists uh, looking at it and they say again that it's related to hieroglyphics in ancient Sumerian. At various times over the past six years, Tracy has also produced a series of graphical illustrations, which she claims she later discovered hold a hidden message. And that circle's dropping over the top of that pyramid. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And yet again it fits. So these are all done over different periods of time and yet they all lock together yes. to form a whole. Yes. Looking at just on a purely surface level, there is an element of storytelling. Apparently this depicts the past and moving into the present and then yeah. moving into the future. And that element of storytelling I can relate to because they have a similarity to stained glass windows and telling a spiritual story. And the lotus blossoms. And that bursting forth, yeah. We probably may maybe never know the answer of where it comes from or how it gets to be in a pencil at the tip of her hand, but you can't take away from the fact that there is something there. It's common for abductees to claim to be given special abilities as a result of their experience. Typically, these will include the ability to heal or to be able to pass on messages to humanity. If in some way the messages that are coming through me can assist other people and the planet that they're connected to, I think it's, it's great. One of the things that has to always be borne in mind about the abduction experience is that the communication in virtually all these cases is telepathic. So one has to assume that every abductee can pick up thoughts from the aliens and, and communicate uh, non-verbally. Therefore, that's a basic a paranormal gift. Is that something that only abductees have, or is that something that might be more extensively present in the population? We don't really know. Believers argue that people who return with enhanced psychic abilities provide yet further proof that their experience was real. People who've had this experience claim that they have unusual powers. But in actual fact, they don't seem able to demonstrate these powers under controlled conditions. If they could, then that would be absolutely amazing. But at the moment, the, the wider scientific community doesn't even accept that these kind of claim powers are real. Yeah. Skeptics continue to dismiss the types of evidence ufologists and believers have to offer. But can they ignore the medical opinion of a qualified surgeon? Especially one who claims that strange objects he has removed from abductees defy earthly explanation. We have those which are metallic and covered with this very, very strange membrane. And at the time of surgery, it can't be cut with a surgical blade. It's impervious to cutting. Rachel Devereaux had her first missing time experience just three months ago while driving home. Having looked into the phenomenon, she has decided to take a bold but common step for people who have had this type of encounter. Hi. Hi. She's going to have hypnotic regression. I'm feeling quite nervous about it, about the uh, regression, um, but also quite excited. Right, so you might not have done this before, but I've done it a few thousand times. Rachel's hoping that under hypnosis she can be taken back to when she had her experience and retrieve memories that are not consciously accessible. I want it to be an honest account, you know, if I do remember. How do you feel? Happy. It's no walls, it's just black everywhere. It's like standing in the middle of space. There's big, big bright light here, right in front of me. That's high, and that's watching what the little ones are doing, the small ones going around and looking at us and talking to each other. They think the boys are funny. 
They think they're funny. I can hear laughing now. The children are laughing. They're really giggling. <laughs> I'm scared for the children. But the light's there and it's just telling me it's fine and we're not going to hurt them. They're your children. They're your children, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Just feel yourself coming back more and more alert. Good, well done. How do you feel? Wow. <laughs> I can't believe how real that felt. From my perspective, having completed thousands of regressions over the years. She didn't fabricate that. She no. didn't pretend uh, to cry. Speechless. I'm <laughs> just kind of speechless. Do I believe everything that happened? I'm sort of 90% there, yeah, that it was real. Testimonies obtained from abductees under hypnosis often provide compelling, detailed accounts of what happened during their missing time episode. They have given ufologists a mountain of anecdotal evidence to support their claims. But skeptics find these reports unreliable. The alien abduction phenomenon, I, I think, is somewhat complicated by the whole debate about hypnosis. Let's be honest, scientists don't even agree on what hypnosis is. People typically think that hypnotic regression is this kind of magic key for unlocking repressed or hidden memories. In actual fact, it's a great way of producing false memories. It's based on expectations, it's based on imagination. It's all we woven together, and then they believe in this narrative. In the hands of the wrong people, it can be disastrous. Uh, and uh, in the hands of the right people, people who know what they're doing, who have adequate controls in place for false memories and things like that, hypnosis is an excellent tool for getting at the truth. With such a major source of research ignored by skeptics, the need for unequivocal physical evidence is all the more important. In America, a surgeon has come forward with claims which may provide ufologists with the break they've been hoping for. I started this as the ultimate uh, skeptic. I was uh, then uh, embroiled in the phenomena and shown things that could not be satisfactorily explained by our own science. Dr. Lear has been a practicing foot surgeon for the past 35 years. But in 1994, he began removing foreign bodies from patients who claimed they were alien implants. I'm going to numb you up right now. Is that all right? OK, that's fine. So we're going to numb the area up real good. A lot of these people have uh, uh, things in their bodies which they've stepped on or they're exposed in a machine shop to a piece of metal. We'll make a small incision right here, not a big one. Uh, others, uh, unfortunately, have mental problems and would like to be an abductee. Since he started in this area eight years ago, Dr. Lear has conducted 11 operations and claims to have removed an assortment of mysterious objects. Looks like it to me. Looks black. Yeah. Here it is, here. So let's put a piece of white gauze. I think this is it, so we're going to x-ray to make sure. Uh, we have those which are metallic and covered with this very, very strange membrane. And at the time of surgery, it can't be cut with a surgical blade. It's impervious to cutting. And researching the pathology books, no such entity has ever been found in the human body. A logic explanation would be that it's not human tissue, of course. However, when we get into the metals, that's when we really get into the strange stuff. We had help from the National Institute for Discovery Science, and they sent the first set of specimens to Los Alamos National Labs and to Mexi New Mexico Tech. Now, these were blind studies. All the studies are blind, and I mean by that that the laboratories are not told the origin of the specimens. And the best analogy that the scientists were able to make initially were these were very close to meteorites. The scientific community has generally disregarded Dr. Lear's claims. They feel his studies are inconclusive and are not supervised closely enough to rule out any chance that his samples may have been tampered with. Uh, metallic uh, object. 
in this uh, container is uh, being sealed. Dr. Lear stands by his claims and thinks it is the skeptics who are at fault. I have never met a skeptic yet that didn't know everything about what I was doing and drawn all the conclusion, but has never looked at one shred of the physical evidence or the data. The moment of truth has arrived for Eric. With the X-ray and ultrasound results returned to the consultant, Eric is about to discover if the lump behind his ear is natural or extraterrestrial. Il faudra que ce corps médical puisse aussi expliquer comment une telle protubérance peut bouger de 12 mm en 6 mois. First thing I want to show you is the ultrasound report and the ultrasound scan. And as you can see here, there is the lesion that we are looking at, and it's just under the surface of the skin. And the appearances are those in keeping with a cyst and nothing else. And when we look at the plain X-ray, there certainly is nothing metallic uh, or anything of a hard consistency mm -hmm. uh, in this lump. And uh, uh, this is, again, in keeping with the diagnosis of a benign cystic lesion. We call it a sebaceous cyst. It's a collection of um, material from a blocked sweat gland. And it arises when a sweat pore becomes obstructed and the normal sebaceous material is not able to escape and therefore collects under the skin surface and forms a cystic collection. Could it be possible to have an explanation about how uh, a cyst could move from one way to, from one point to another one? There is no easy solution or answer to that problem. I am, all I can speculate is that there may have been an episode of inflammation, which is typical of these cysts. Well, thank you very much indeed. Oui, l'organisme peut être parfaitement naturel. Uh, or, nous ignorons tout de la technologie des extraterrestres. Donc, uh, on ne peut pas définitivement uh, repousser l'hypothèse que ce soit un implant extraterrestre. Although Dr. Patel believes his findings are conclusive, Eric remains unconvinced by such an orthodox diagnosis. And his concerns are shared by implant specialist Dr. Lear. The object is uh, certainly rectangular. Uh, the color is not normal for the skin. Uh, he claims that it has moved. That certainly negates something being a sebaceous cyst. Uh, sebaceous, the word uh, sebaceous comes from the word sebum, which is a gland attached to a hair follicle. And that becomes inflamed and infected, and that's how you get a sebaceous cyst. They would not move from one hair follicle to another. If we got one of these implants and it turns out that it's of, of alien technology or that it's made of materials that wouldn't be easy to find on Earth, then great, it's a fantastic scientific breakthrough. When dealing with this phenomenon, skeptics argue that the evidence does not exist, whereas ufologists say the evidence is there, but science just doesn't know how to interpret it. It would seem that without a miraculous breakthrough, there is little chance of either side reaching a common understanding. However, there are a new set of theories developed by the world's leading physicists that believers point to as holding the key to explaining this mystery. A lot of physicists think we're entering a new golden age of theoretical physics. Um, in a way, we're beginning to be able to address questions such as why is the universe here at all? Dr. Brian Cox is a particle physicist who is directly involved with multi-million dollar experiments to find out if the universe could contain hidden dimensions that are still to be discovered. In the last 10 years, theories have been developed where we need other dimensions to explain the way the universe looks to us. So not only three dimensions, up, down and across, and even a fourth one, time, but actually something like 10 or 11 dimensions. That means there's a whole swathe of the universe out there that we really know very little about. Extra dimensions, there could be a centimeter away from my head, an entire universe with, you know, things could live there for all, for all we know. Also, there can be wormholes, so these, these are tunnels in, in space-time. So you could pop into a wormhole at one end of the universe and instantaneously appear at another end of the universe. And those tunnels could even be between one time in the universe to another. So they could, in principle, uh, allow time travel to happen. Now, we don't know whether those things exist or not, but the theory allows them to exist. 
These theories do not provide any evidence to support the claims of abductees, but they do offer a framework that can explain the universe and our place within it. And perhaps that's exactly what the missing time phenomenon is all about, trying to find a belief system that makes sense of our world and universe. I think your belief system plays a part in interpreting, as it were, what you think you've seen. If you see a figure at the foot of your bed, if you're religious, you might think you've seen um, an angel. If, if you believe in the paranormal, you might say you've seen a ghost. If you're a, a ufologist, you might say that's an alien. We live in a culture where it's easier to believe in God. It's saner to believe in a God than it is to believe that there's life on other planets. We have multiple witness sightings of people seeing extraterrestrials and their occupants. That's a no-no, there's a stigma. But if you believe in God, that's okay. I find that very interesting. Most scientists agree that the universe is both old enough and large enough for extraterrestrial life to exist. Whether we've made contact with it yet depends on who or what you believe. <laughs>